In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I have found my thoughts turning toward hope with increasing frequency over the last year, and not because the year has shown a lot of bright promise. Quite the opposite. Had we time and trust enough to open our hearts fully to each other in this worship space, we could go around and name the grave concerns, both public and personal, that haunt our sleep by night and occupy our thoughts by day. Various ones of us might name climate crisis, racism and other forms of social division, family tension, public health crises and personal health crises, horrific war in Europe, and fear of much worse. And in this country, violence in our homes and on our streets. Any or all of those concerns may bring you here to Calvary at lunchtime on a Wednesday, on a day that promises to be stormy, and you might well have stayed at home. So let's talk about hope, because the going is pretty rough now. And from a biblical perspective, that is precisely the time when hope is activated. This we learn from the Apostle Paul. When the going gets tough, the tough get hopeful. Paul writes to Christ the Christians in Rome to support them in the face of persecution. We know, Paul says, that suffering produces tough endurance. Endurance produces tested character, and character produces hope. You might suppose that you have to be a saint like Paul to believe that, or maybe a fanatic. Paul may have been that too. But my students have shown me a third possibility. My students are neither saints nor fanatics, but they are practitioners of hope. And what I see in them is that hope is something you learn to do well. As my students mature in their theological understanding and their faith, many also mature in their ability to practice hope. That is to face squarely and bravely the profound difficulties of this time in which they are coming of age in ministry. Christian hope needs to be consciously practiced because it does not come naturally. It has nothing to do with having a sunny disposition or an optimistic reading of the situation in which we find ourselves. No, hope of the kind that Paul has in mind is not a mood that comes and goes with the weather in the daily news. It might be better to think of hope as a commitment, a spiritual discipline, and Lent as a season for practicing hope until we get tolerably good at it. One of my students recently art articulated his own new understanding of hope as something you learn to do well. Avery is a professional working in the area of education about climate crisis. And he took a class I taught on reading the Bible in light of climate change. At the end of that class, he summed up his learning thus. I used to roll my eyes, he said, when I heard Christians speak about hope, because I thought they had their heads in the sand. 
But now I have a different perspective, and I see my own role differently. Now I understand that as a Christian climate activist, my job is to be an agent of hope to speak the plain truth so people can hear it, and at the same time, to offer them the resources for living with realistic hope. When the going gets tough, the tough get resourceful. So following Avery's lead, I focus now on the single best resource for cultivating a realistic hope in our life with God, namely the book of Psalms. Some of what the psalmists have to teach about the dynamics of hope may be surprising to you, because they are often more honest than many of us dare to be when we talk to God. They don't think they have to have something nice to say before they get started. And that is exactly why the psalmist can guide us, because the practice of hope involves prayer. And real prayer often begins when we tell God the truth about our troubles. Listen to how the first prayer in the book of Psalms begins. I'm reading to you from Psalm 3, but that is the first psalm that speaks directly to God. Lord, how many are my foes? So many rising up against me. But you, O oh Lord, are, are a shield for me, my glory the one who lifts up my head. Even these few lines help us see more clearly the difference between genuine hope and optimism. We might feel optimistic when things are going along pretty much as we wish, and we have come to expect they will continue that way. I wonder how much sincere prayer is generated by optimism. But these words in Psalm 3 situate prayer very differently. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Hostile people pressing hard against me, and yet, O oh Lord, you are a shield for me. So many rising up against me, desperation welling up within me, and yet you, God, are the one who, en who enables me to hold up my head. Is that a crazy fantasy or something more? Could a hopeful prayer such as this one be a lifeline tossed out in God's direction, a cord cast out of a desperate situation on the chance or the expectation that God will catch the other end and draw me to safety. It is, in fact, the Hebrew word for hope that suggests to me the image of a lifeline. Forgive me if I sound like the Hebrew teacher I am for a minute. The verb hope, kaveh in Hebrew, the word hope in the Psalms most often refers to our stance toward God. The verb kaveh, hope, is derived from the noun kav, which means a straight line between two points. In this case, hope is the line drawn between what God has done in the past for me and for others and what God has yet to do to bring relief and deliverance in this present and fear-filled situation. 
Those are the two anchor points for hope. What God has done, what God has yet to do. And so the one who prays to God in hope is something like a climber on a dangerous passage, holding on to that line for dear life while moving along the edge of the chasm filled with anxiety, threat, uncertainty. If you keep that image in mind, then I think you can hear the drama in a psalm such as the one we have just heard. I wonder if you noticed in the reading the drastic shift in tone that happens halfway through. The psalmist starts out with seemingly unshakable confidence. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom would I be afraid? When the malicious draw near me to eat my flesh, it is they who stumble and fall. If war breaks out against me, in this I trust. Unshakable confidence. And then suddenly it all dissolves. Having just declared God to be her light and her salvation, the psalmist resorts to abject pleading. Do not forsake me. Do not abandon me, O God of my salvation. Do not give me into the gullet of my foes. Now the crucial question is, how do you hold those two together? Some biblical commentators will tell you that this psalm was originally two different psalms, two different prayers, one expressing confidence, the other a strong plea for rescue. And some scribe just slapped them together into one psalm for no good reason. Maybe they were running short of vellum. This strikes me as the kind of thing that gives biblical scholarship a bad name. However, anyone who prays or tries to pray knows that the shift from confidence to panic bespeaks a spiritual truth that pious people don't like to admit. Namely, that confidence in God is a sometime thing. You might feel rock-solid assurance one moment and then the next, you're not so sure. And because that is true, then you have to ask if those expressions of fear mean that the psalmist is turning away from God. I don't think so. God is named in nearly every verse of Psalm 27, a total of 14 times God is named in 14 verses. Far from turning away from God then, it seems that the psalmist is pressing ever closer, becoming ever more insistent and persistent, even as her feelings shift like sand. The key theological insight here comes from Martin Luther in his remarkable commentary on the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Luther says that having no other gods means simply this, turning to the one God with both parts of our heart, both trust and fear. That's Luther, and, but isn't that exactly what we see in this psalm? The honest believer turning and returning to God in both certainty and radical uncertainty, leaning hard on the relationship of deep mutuality that the Bible calls covenant. 
That is what it is to have one God and only one. I never hear this psalm without seeing in my mind the face of one particular student many years ago. Now he is himself a professor of theology. But I recall his first year in divinity school when he chose to write a paper on our psalm because this one verse was his personal lifeline. Even if my father and my mother abandon me, the Lord will take me in. As a child, this man had been sexually abused by both his parents. By the grace of God, he survived, wounded, but not completely broken. Miraculously, the lifeline of hope connecting him to God remained intact. It dragged him out whenever the total horror of the past threatened to overwhelm him. I see his face, both gentle and deeply intent, whenever I hear or repeat this penultimate verse of our psalm. Were I not sure of looking upon the Lord's goodness in the land of the living, dot, 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 the thought remains incomplete. The psalmist will not go there, will not finish the sentence, refuses even to imagine that spiritual dead end, what it would mean not to see God's goodness in the land of the living. Immediately following that unfinished thought, the poet singer turns to us, her, her hearers, for the first time. The last line of the psalm is addressed to us. Listen. Look in hope to the Lord. Be strong, and may your heart take courage, and look in hope to the Lord. Now, at the end of the psalm, we are called to an active stance of hope. Look in hope, be strong, take courage. Kave, look in hope. Kave, this is the Hebrew verb I mentioned a few minutes ago. With its inference of tension, a line drawn taut. Be strong. The psalmist is fortifying us to hold that lifeline of hope in unpromising situations. Because hope is a spiritual skill, both necessary and difficult, you may want to return to this psalm. However, if you happen to be an Episcopalian, I warn you in advance that the Book of Common Prayer messes with, this, with its translation of this crucial final verse. I grew up with the Book of Common Prayer. I love it in my bones. And yet I confess that it makes the language of hope in this psalm and really throughout the Psalter anemic. This is the prayer book translation of that line. O oh, tarry and await the Lord's pleasure. Wait patiently for the Lord. O oh, tarry and await the Lord's pleasure. Tell that to Ukrainians desperate to escape rocket fire, or children frantic to fend off sexual predation in their own home. Wait patiently. 
Tell that to the youth who see time slipping away to address the issue of climate emergency while we still have a chance. Wait on tenterhooks is more like it. Hope in God as though your life and everything you hold most dear depended on it, which in fact it does. The psalmist is helping us to reckon with the truth that hoping in God is the very most demanding mode of faith. As we try to hold the fine balance between genuine trust and honest anxiety. Hope in God is practiced always, always in precarious situations, which is why the psalmist leaves us with that exhortation, be strong and may your heart take courage. Hoping in God is nothing other than the most courageous form of trust. In trust, we come to a worship service such as this one, drawn by memories of God's faithfulness in the past to us and our ancestors, to our people. We take shelter in the place where we think God may show up. We seek out the subtle signs of God's presence, a familiar prayer, a beloved hymn, reassuring as the first violets popping up through dead leaves, penetrating us like the mild light of spring, gently nudging us forward. But sometimes there is nothing at all gentle about the work of hope, just the affront of felt absence, the rawness of seeking God and coming up empty. That is when we recognize how much courage hope requires. Courage and dare I say it, holy impatience. Though we see no sign, we cry out to God and do not let up. Hold on to the covenant promise and push it in God's face, demanding an answer to our prayer. That's not me, that's Isaiah, in case you want to check it. In both hope and courage, we claim as real and essential every flickering possibility that somehow leaps to life, like bright, fragile wildflowers emerging in the early days of spring. Were I not sure of looking upon Adonai's goodness, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, don't finish that thought. Don't ever finish it. Let us pray instead for the strength to live in the tense hope the psalmist is teaching us to practice. May we have the courage to commit ourselves to searching out God's goodness wherever we find ourselves. The clear eyes to see it springing forth anew in this time, in every precarious situation into which we are sent. Amen.